Hey there lovelies, welcome back to my channel. I know it has been a while since I posted and I've not been nearly as consistent as I wanted to be this year, but that is okay because I'm still doing the things that I want to do and I'm creating the videos that I want to create. I'm just not posting them as quickly as I would like to. Today's video is so exciting. I am so excited. I've been looking forward to this since like October and I wanted to get this posted in February for Heart Month but unfortunately it just didn't happen and you know sometimes that's just how it goes and that's okay but today's video is the first in a series of videos i would like to do and i have already created and filmed and started editing um, but today's video is an interview that i did with taylor hulahan who is a third year medical student and a chd warrior and I got to talk to her a little bit about her experience with CHD and how her diagnosis has shaped trajectory of the rest of her life. There we go. Awesome. Yay. It's awesome. Okay. <laughs> so first, I just want to ask, like, who are you? Um, what do you do? I know you're in med school. Yeah. Um, where are you from? Just kind of a little bit of a background. Yeah, sure. So my name is Taylor Houlihan. Um, I am currently a third year medical student at Thomas Jefferson University. So that's in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, I grew up in the kind of Philadelphia suburb area. Um, so this is somewhat close to home for me. Um, and I also happen to have complex congenital heart disease. Yeah. So I know um, from your Instagram, it says you have uh, quite a few CHDs, actually. <laughs> um, so try, correct me if I'm wrong, but tricuspid mm -hmm. atresia, yeah. um, transposition of the great vessels, and mm -hmm. dextrocardia. Yeah. Well, so what, um, well, first, how old were you when you were diagnosed? Do you remember any of that? Yeah, so interestingly, I was not diagnosed till I was six months old, um, okay. which I feel like now is pretty unusual because they're able to detect a lot of these things in utero. Um, so my parents kind of had a false sense of assurance for a little bit um, until I started not doing as great. Um, so yeah, I was diagnosed at six months, and then pretty soon after, I had my first open heart surgery. Um, and yeah, I, of course, have you know, no memory or really recollection yeah. <laughs> of that at all. Um, but yeah, it was definitely kind of a shock for my family. Obviously, they thought that I was healthy <laughs> when I was born and I wasn't even like a blue baby or anything like that. Um, so it definitely was a surprise for the family. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was. So if you weren't a blue baby, how mm -hmm. they noticed that anything was wrong? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, when I was born, my pediatrician had said that she heard a heart murmur, um, but my pediatrician thought it was just like an innocent heart murmur, so nothing to do. Um, but unfortunately, like as I started growing, um, I had more challenges with like feeding, um, and I started kind of losing weight, which is usually like a telltale sign that something is obviously yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, my parents actually, I was born in Columbia, Maryland and around six months of age, my family moved back to like the Philadelphia suburb area. Okay. Um, and I think when we transitioned to like a new pediatrician, they were like, hey, something isn't right here. Um, and that's okay. kind of when all the pieces fell in place. So Okay. Interesting. Good. Yeah. I, I don't want to say like it's good that like you have this because I think we all kind of have that weird um sense of like oh I don't know what my life would be without it but also right. it's good that you weren't super sick as a baby and they were yeah. just you know, able to casually find out because yeah. I know too many people who found out after being life flighted to a hospital you right? know yeah, yeah yeah um so is there a difference so just more specifically about your defects, mm -hmm. you've heard of transposition of the great arteries. So mm -hmm. is that different from transposition of the great vessels? Yeah, so actually they're one and the same. Okay. Um, 
That's so, what I was not sure about. Yeah, it's like the aorta and the pulmonary artery are switched. So we call okay. them either the great vessels or the great arteries. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Like, I'm not in the medical field. I know. No, like, yeah, I know. It's I know easy. just enough of my, like, heart defect to get around. But yeah. other people, I love to learn, but I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know quite enough. Yeah. Um, so what is tricuspid atresia then? Yeah, so tricuspid atresia, basically, when you look at the heart, right, you have two atria, mm -hmm. which are kind of your collecting chambers, and then you have the two ventricles. Um, and the tricuspid valve is the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Um, and the right side of the heart is the side of the heart that kind of collects all the venous blood that's coming from the body back to the heart. And then the right side of the heart then pumps the blood directly to the lungs. Um, so in my heart, my tricuspid valve had never really formed. Um, and because of that, my right ventricle was severely underdeveloped because it never was stretched or had to pump blood, um, thus categorizing me as having hypoplastic right heart syndrome. Okay. So that's kind of how all those pieces fit together. Okay. And then the dextrocardia. Mm -hmm. So one. Dextro <laughs> I know, yeah. So basically a normal or a kind of healthy anatomical heart, um, the apex or the point of the heart usually points towards the left side of the body. Um, so that's kind of how we have all of our like EKGs oriented and things like that. Um, dextrocardia basically just means that my heart apex points to the right side of my body instead. Um, so everything is kind of like flipped a little bit, um, which makes kind of identifying structures <laughs> even more confusing and challenging than it already is. Um, so you have, so your heart is essentially flipped over, correct? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then on top of that, your vessels are still flipped again. <laughs> so <laughs> you're a little bit confusing. <laughs> I don't know how my poor surgeons figured everything out, but they got everything to work eventually. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so where do you get your cardiac care then? Yeah. So I have been receiving my cardiac care from CHOP ever since I was young. I had all my surgeries there um, and CHOP being Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, I recently, this past year, transitioned into adult care. Um, my cardiologist, my pediatric cardiologist, was able to see me through college. Um, and then after that, she um, referenced me to a new adult um, congenital heart disease cardiologist. And, and that is Dr. Yuli Kim. And she is at um, University of Pennsylvania. So it's nice. I've been able to kind of stay within the same kind of like pen system so to speak um so that's made the transition a little bit easier um for me do you mind if I ask how old you are and like how yeah. that started yeah so I'm 24 years old okay. um I know every pediatric cardiologist is a little bit different mm -hmm. and every kind of program is a little bit different as to how long they'll see patients for um my cardiologist my pediatric cardiologist um was comfortable seeing me through college. So I think I was probably around like 21 or 22 when I graduated. Um, and then after that, I went through the process of then um, switching to adult care. Um, and it just so happened too that my pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Marie Gleason, she also was retiring at the same time. So it was like, okay. I didn't even really have the option to stay with her if I wanted to. Um, okay. But yeah. yeah, sometimes that can make things easier, but also harder at the same time. Yeah. It's like, oh, I want to stay, but I can't because obviously you're not here anymore. But right. Um, right. so how was that transition then just moving not only providers, but also you said locations? Yeah. Um, so fortunately, the University of Pennsylvania, the hospital um, at UPenn is like right across the street from Children's Hospital. Um, so location wise, it wasn't too challenging um I think the like hardest part is just like I think a lot of people with congenital heart disease they sort of feel like they're stuck between two worlds because like in some ways it's very much like a pediatric problem um as in like obviously like adults that would normally see a cardiologist usually they have you know like coronary artery disease or other kind of like very adult um issues whereas congenital heart disease 
exactly yeah yeah um so I think that's a little bit weird feeling like you're stuck between two worlds um and you're obviously like you're one of the youngest ones at the adult hospital but you're like the oldest one at the pediatric hospital um but fortunately my um my adult cardiologist she's really great um she's super active in the like adult congenital heart disease community um and so she's like very knowledgeable and all kind of like growing up um I had heard like a lot about her just from like different conferences different like parent um patient education events they would put on so although I never knew her like personally before I transitioned care to her um I felt like very comfortable that I was going to be in really good hands. That's awesome. That's really, yeah, that's a good thing to have. And I've yeah, definitely like I transitioned from um, Children's Hospital of Illinois to mm. U of M. And yeah. while my, um, I'm still in the pediatric area though. Um, right. But while my cardiologist doesn't do those things, like my mom has talked to like the, um, ACHA, um, mm-hmm. oh gosh, what am I saying? The ACHA, like Facebook Lives about COVID and everything, yeah. like some of the, my doctor's colleagues have been doing those. So it's like, I know of the people there, but it's not, now it's like meeting everybody that I've right. heard about. Yeah. Um. So I've noticed that you say congenital heart disease. Mm-hmm. So what do you... I know there's like a lot of back and forth yeah. about disease versus defect. I grew up saying defect. Um, yeah. And my, one of my teachers was like, so you have a defect? Like how that just sounds like there's something wrong with you. I was like, well, there is something <laughs> wrong with me. And I mean, for me, like when I think of disease, I think like kind of old and icky, but yeah. what, you, what are your thoughts on it? <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, I feel like I kind of use all those words, like, interchangeably. Um, I acknowledge there's, like, some people that are, like, very sensitive about the terminology, and I know some people even, per like, prefer the term, like, congenital heart difference. Um, I heard that one. Yeah, and I'm, like, very much, like, I think for me, like, coming from a medical background, it's kind of, like, that's just like the terminology that we use like between physicians. Um, But like, I'm like very sensitive to like those who, you know, really would prefer um, like a different term because I do acknowledge that not that there's like a stigma, but it's kind of more of like a negative connotation when we see something like disease or defect. Um, I think either way, (laughs) especially after my teacher was like, it sounds like there's something wrong with you. I was like, well, yeah, okay. Then I guess no matter how you look at it, it looks like there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that's, it's just very interesting, the different worlds that people come from and how they think about things. Um, And then you were also saying like, you're in the adult center now, Mm -hmm. um, but you're like one of the younger people. And Mm -hmm. last week I... I'm totally fine, but I was like in a car crash and I had to go to the ER. Mm. And I they had to take me to the pacemaker like mm-hmm. part of the and I just remember like I passed all the rooms and it was a bunch of like excuse me, but like old people <laughs> pacemakers. And so all of the nurses and all the staff were like, wait, does she have a pacemaker? Does she have a pacemaker? I'm like, I'm 22, but I've yeah. had pacemakers. I was like one and a half. Yeah. Like and then when they were going to do the interrogation they like tried to put it like in my shoulder like move the mm-hmm. I don't know what it's called like the giant mouse that's how I describe it like yeah it, <laughs> they wanted to put it in my shoulder I was like nope it's it's in my belly still I don't yeah so yeah it's definitely a weird space to be in as you get older but you're not quite you're not quite there yet right yeah um so do 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 have you had any open heart surgeries Yeah, so I have had a total of two. Um, My first one, like I was saying, was um, when I was six months old, so very soon after I was initially diagnosed. Um, And that surgery consisted of the the Glenn procedure, which is kind of like a portion of the Fontan, um, as well as the um, Damus K. Stanzel procedure, which is the procedure that kind of corrects the um, transposition of the the great arteries um and then my second surgery was um at one and a half and that was to complete my fontan 
Um, and since then, I've been really fortunate. I have not needed any additional open That's heart awesome. surgeries. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. That's so, awesome. I can't remember what you called it, but the surgery mm -hmm. to flip your vessels back. Yeah, yeah. So, we talked about how, like, your heart is flipped over and then your mm -hmm. arteries. So, are your arteries then fixed but also flipped over? <laughs> like, it's... yeah. So I think the biggest thing is they just wanted to make sure that my aorta, which is the blood vessel that um, kind of delivers all the blood from the heart out to the body, they wanted to make sure that my aorta was connected to my left ventricle, which is the main kind of like pumping chamber that pumps the blood out to the rest of the body. So I kind of just think of it as they made sure that the aorta was connected to that portion of the heart. Um, cause in actuality, because my right ventricle was underdeveloped, um, even if they like reconnected my pulmonary artery, which is the vessel that would take the blood from the right side of the heart to the lungs, um, my right ventricle wasn't doing anything anyway. So, yeah. um, yeah. Okay. Um, I have like a short list of questions. I'm just trying to remember which ones I asked. <laughs> Um, so you don't have any like implanted devices like a pacemaker or a defibrillator or anything like that? No, no. Was that, I've been... was that ever like a topic of possible conversation? Yeah, I actually, I've been like very fortunate so far. I have not really had any rhythm problems, um, awesome. no arrhythmias or anything. Um, so of course down the road that certainly could um, become an issue. But as a brain, no, I have not um, needed any of those devices. That's really awesome. That's good for you. Like, <laughs> awesome. Um, so what specific um, events led you to wanting to go into the medical field? Or is it just kind of like a broad general kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think definitely like kind of growing up in the medical field as a patient, um, obviously you're like exposed to a lot of things that like other little kids would never be exposed to otherwise. So I think, um, it just made me very curious about medicine. Um, I know for some people, like after a lot of their surgeries and experiences, it's kind of like traumatizing and triggering. Um, <laughs> but for whatever reason, I was like very curious, um, and I wanted to kind of learn more and learn, you know why they did the things they did and like what was wrong with me when I was born um, and things like that. So I think ever since a young age, I was very interested. I would like go to the public library and take out all the little kid like anatomy books and medical books. Um, yeah. And I think also um, when I was maybe around like five, um, my uncle at the time was going through um, medical school um, so that was really cool for me to be able to, um, when he'd like come home on breaks and things, um, to see some of his like books and study materials, um, oh, cool. and ask him like a lot of questions. So I feel like that was also kind of like a helpful kind of like nudge towards yeah. the um, medical field. Yeah. So you were always just kind of, kind of, that was set for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Um, um, so what, do you have a specialty that you'd like to go into? Do you want to like focus on heart defects or do you want to do something else? Yeah. Um, so I'm third year of medical school is when you kind of rotate through all of the sort of major areas of medicine. Um, and so far I have really, um, probably enjoyed pediatrics the most, um, which I'm not surprised about. I was kind <laughs> of going and thinking I would want to do on um, pediatric medicine, um, I think down the road, I would love to um, kind of specifically focus on pediatric cardiology um, and like congenital heart um, specifically, but I'm still trying to kind of keep my possibilities open for now. Um, I will say, I think thus far, I've kind of ruled out surgery. I'm not sure I want to be yeah. a surgeon, <laughs> um, but I definitely love like the medical aspect, talking to patients. I like the like parent child dynamics that come along with pediatrics and kind of that like extra layer of like decision making um, that needs to happen and kind of communication between the family and the child. So, yeah. Awesome. That's super exciting. That's, I, 
good for you. I'm <laughs> for you. Like, I know this is the first time we met, but like, that's really cool. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been exciting. Okay, so I have a few more questions, um, mm -hmm. mainly about CHD advocacy yeah. and awareness. So yeah. how do you think your diagnosis or diagnoses, I guess, mm -hmm. um, have shaped the trajectory of what you um, want to or what you want to do like outside of CHD advocacy and outside of um, going into the medical field and things like that? Mm. Well, I think like my diagnoses kind of like outside of advocacy in the medical field, um, I think they've just like made me a lot more aware of kind of like how important it is to like care for your body um, and just how to learn to be really in tune with your body um, and strike a balance between, you know, exerting yourself and pushing yourself, but also kind of knowing when to, to take breaks and really allow your body to rest. Um, and that's something I'm like still working on a lot. Um, but I think I have like really just, um, become a lot more interested in kind of like nutrition and wellness, um, and fitness in ways that like I may not have otherwise um, if I didn't kind of have this like um, heart condition and obviously, you know, concerns about potential complications and things in the future. Um, so I think that um, I think also like kind of within but outside of advocacy within like the congenital heart group, I think um, having like a heart condition, having like a chronic medical illness, it just gives you a lot of kind of empathy for others um, mm -hmm. who might be suffering and struggling, whether it's with a heart condition or, you know, there's so many other chronic conditions. So I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've just learned a lot about, you know, there's a lot of people that um, deal with a lot of medical issues on a daily basis. Um, and that really can take a lot out of you, both like physically, but also like mentally and emotionally. Um, and I think just being like really sensitive um, towards others who, who are struggling with those things as well. Yeah, I think for sure, definitely just knowing like there are, you know, there's people who haven't had to deal with any of any mental or physical or any mm -hmm. health problems. And so you see, I'm not saying the way that they see things is wrong, but you just see how they react to certain situations and you mm -hmm. just, and then you see others who um, you have those problems and you see how you react to those problems that even though they're different right. from you, they're very, they're very real to that person, even though it might yeah. not seem that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, totally. Okay. So my last question, what does CHD awareness mean to you and how does your work um, like on Instagram or mm -hmm. going into the medical field, how yeah. does that support what um, CHD is? Or is she yeah. yeah, that's an awesome question. I think there's a lot of different facets to that. Um, okay. I think, um, first of all, CHD awareness, I think like it's very important within the CHD community for others to be aware that like they are not alone. Um, and there are a lot of people out there with CHD um, who are living life and who are doing all that they can. Um, so I think it's very important, like for me, when I grew up, I didn't really know anyone else who had CHD. Mm -hmm. um, and really until like starting kind of my page and things, um, like I feel like I've just these past few months, I've already met like so many people um, who like share a lot of the same things I do with regards to like health and things like that. Um, okay. And that's just been such like an encouragement. And, you know, I think it's sometimes there's definitely hard days and sad days, but to know that there are other people who are definitely dealing with the same exact things you are, um, that's just like really great to have that type of community. Um, I think CHD awareness is also um, important for um, families um, and people who yeah. may be getting like a prenatal diagnosis. Um, I think one of the goals of my page was just to um, offer parents and families some hope. Um, I think, you know, it's amazing the technology that we have to be able to make those diagnoses um, and detect um, heart conditions in utero. But I think um, we still have a long way to go sometimes when it comes to counseling these families. And I think, unfortunately, some families are given um, just like very um, 
pessimistic um, Mm -hmm. views or information about um, the potential of their child to have a full life. Um, And I feel very passionate about um, educating families about, you know, the possibility that their child could um, really live to have a full life. Um, And obviously it's very difficult, especially in the beginning years to have a child um, with congenital heart disease, Um, the surgeries, the hospital time, it's very stressful. Um, But I think, you know, we cannot make a call as to the child's outlook on life um, when they're still in utero, regardless of what we see on that anatomy scan or things like that. Um, So I think my patient has been very important to me um, and just reaching out to families and showing them, hey, you know, this is going to be hard, um, but there's certainly hope for your child and for their future. Um, So, yeah. And I think finally, CHD awareness, is just like awareness to the larger medical community, Um, even those that are not within like the cardiac field. um, I think obviously as more and more patients with CHD reach adulthood, um, you're gonna have them entering into a lot of different spheres of medicine, needing to see lots of different types of Mm -hmm. doctors. Um, And I think, you know, ensuring that doctors in every field um, are like aware of CHD, aware of the specific patient population's needs, um, and kind of like unique features. Um, I think that's really going to be important moving forward. Um, and I think we've already seen moves like that, like for instance, within like hepatology, we know a lot of Fontan patients down the road will start to have liver problems. Um, and, you know, there's a, a lot of hepatologists and groups that are already making moves to that's coverage awesome. that gap, which is really awesome. Yeah, I had um, my most recent appointment was like a month ago and my Mm -hmm. cardiologist was like, yeah, we might start getting, she's like, your liver's fine right now, but maybe next year we'll talk about setting you up with a hepatologist. And I was like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) like, don't know. Cause I think growing up, you just like, it's just your heart problem. And as you've, as I've gotten older, I've realized, oh, there's all of these other things that can Mm -hmm. be affected by it that I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about. Exactly. Um, yeah. Oh gosh, I was gonna ask one more thing. I can't remember. Maybe I'll text you about it. <laughs> okay, um, all right. So, what does Heart Month mean to you then, as far as like advocacy and? Oh, I remember actually. Never mind. Oh yeah, okay. go for it. Well, my page, like I just my page didn't start out as a CHD page, and it still isn't totally mm-hmm. a CHD page. But like when I see like other moms or parents or family members that are like we're adding this child with a heart problem to our life Mm -hmm. or we're um, adding, you know, or this super scary thing happened and now we have this thing that we have to deal with. And so it's just very, Mm -hmm. um, like, it's hard to do, I think, especially Mm -hmm. just to put yourself out there and be like, hey, I have this, your kid's going to be okay. It's going to be hard as, it's going to be harder than anything you've ever had to do, but it's Mm -hmm. going to be okay. Um, and so that's just being able to talk to those families and meet new people um, mm-hmm. is very interesting. And I've had like some people from like Germany message me and be like, I found mm-hmm. your baby. And I'm like, whoa, okay. Hi. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I yeah. hope you're doing well, but it's definitely one of those things that's like, I'm glad I can help. But also at the same time, I, I don't want to like almost put too much hope in, but also yeah. not too much fear. It's a very interesting balance of trying to figure mm-hmm. out what to do um and then the other question was you were talking about like getting everybody in just the general medical community um Mm -hmm. pathologists or whoever else to like know more about chds did you go to like urgent or prompt care growing up like um yeah i have had a few emergency room trips okay Um, (laughs) fortunately when i was like younger Usually, I would end up going to Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, and they'd have a lot of my medical records and resources. Um, but I did more recently um, go to an emergency room. I had been like having some chest pain. Um, oh, no. Fortunately, fortunately, like everything was ruled out and it was fine. Um, That's such a I just scary thing. To do, like <laughs> exactly, I should be concerned about or. Yeah, I was like, I just want to get some imaging just to rule out all the big scary things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was definitely going to an adult emergency room in Center City. Um, definitely an interesting experience. Um, my ER physician, 
He was very nice. Um, he was like, you're the first patient I had with dextrocardia. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and part of me is like, yeah, dextrocardia is like the least of my problems. But um, I'm glad that you can use this as a yeah. learning experience. Um, but yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I think um, there's some really interesting research and articles being done about um just kind of like very quick frameworks that like emergency room or urgent care docs can use to work through when they have a patient that specifically has CHD. That's awesome. Yeah, because I think there's definitely like a very specific kind of like subset of issues that might come up in our group that doesn't necessarily come up in other groups. Yeah. Um, not to mention like, you know, the pulse ox might be a little lower than a normal um, person yeah. or other things I've, like that. I've had to like fight with urgent care nurses who like wanted to change where my pulse ox was. I'm like, that's at 94. This is like, yeah. and I'm <laughs> like growing up and dying. So yeah. let's <laughs> move on and get me what I need. But that yeah. was kind of my big question. Like just how, um, like I went to urgent care for an ingrown toenail one time and they gave me um, a sulfa-based medicine, which mm-hmm. I did with my lisinopril, which I use um, yeah. to blood pressure, and then yeah. I passed out. And so my cardiologist was like, we're not going to take those anymore. Like, yeah. Not, just like super small things that shouldn't be a problem suddenly become, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that like a huge problem, but like become bigger yeah. than they needed to be. Yeah. Um, And then just, yeah, just people like wondering like okay why why are you doing this why is this happening and just trying to get across like I'm okay this is normal yeah I know my mom um I we were in Tennessee visiting family and I was I was very little and I had an ear infection and my Mm -hmm. mom just wanted me to get like eardrops but they listened to my heart and so then they were and my mom was like no we know about this this is fine let us get eardrops and so we were at like the hospital way longer than we needed to be because (laughs) do all this like uh workup stuff and just that let's maybe focus on like the actual issue and then if questions come up but yeah yeah um and then my last question is what does heart month mean to you so like february what what does that mean to you as a chd patient as somebody going into the medical field as an advocacy for chd yeah. Well, I think Heart Month is awesome. I think it always is like, there's lots of festivities and extra awareness, but it's like when you live with CHD, it's like every month is kind of Heart Month. <laughs> um, you know, there's never like an isolated time that we kind of like celebrate or aware, um, raise awareness about this. Um, but I think like, um, yeah, I think Heart Month is just like a great month um, just to kind of like increase the visibility of the CHD community. Um, and I think like the CHD community is such a wonderful group of individuals. It's very like international. Um, it's very, you know, all different ages. Um, so it's super exciting just to see people kind of come out of the woodwork that don't necessarily, you know, regularly promote mm-hmm. um or talk about their own personal chd or chd of someone else um that they know um i also love all the the fun things that the hospitals do yeah um, so i know like children's hospital they'll do a lot of um kind of like social media promos mm-hmm. but also like decorations and things around the hospital yeah. um and i think that's awesome because i think it means a lot to the patients um and to the patient families to kind of be valued oh, in that true. way um, and I think also, you know, for those who, who may not be struggling with those issues necessarily, um, just to realize, one, how like common CHD can be, um, you know, it's diagnosed very frequently um, in children and how, you know, it can really range from a very minor, you know, atrial septal defect to something mm-hmm. obviously much more full-blown, like a hypoplastic yeah. left heart syndrome. Um, so, yeah, I think... Heart Month is just like an exciting kind of like extra burst of, of energy yeah. um, to the CHD community. But yeah, definitely, I feel like it was every- kind of like high for like a few weeks. Exactly. After. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so yeah, do you have anything else that you feel is important for me or my viewers or followers mm-hmm. or anybody? No. Um, that's a good question. 
No, I just think. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm trying to think. Parting words. Um, yeah, I think everyone, you know, life is such a gift. Um, and obviously, everyone has their own kind of unique personal struggles with their health yeah. um, and with other areas of life. Um, but I just really believe, you know, approaching things with kind of like positivity and hope. Um, obviously, there is like a lot of fear. Um, that comes with living with CHD and there are a lot of very legitimate things that um, we can be anxious about um, on a day-to-day basis. There's also still like a lot of unknowns um, in our care and and things down the road Um, but I think you know it's important when we approach unknowns um, there it's an opportunity for fear but it's an also an opportunity um, for hope um, you know and to for sure kind of look to the future with with possibility in mind. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Um, I'm super excited to be starting this series. I will let you know when that happens. And I'm super excited. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate it. It was um, so nice meeting you. <laughs> so we definitely, once like everything like settles down in the world, we need to figure out a way to get like people on Instagram to like one central physical yeah. location and just be like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> community of of chg people so yeah so i'm awesome. sure i will talk to you soon um mm-hmm. i'll definitely see you on instagram so yeah <laughs> great rest of your day thank um, you yeah see ya yeah, bye, bye. <laughs>